when we last saw our hero question mark he was lamenting a dead hard drive and now we return to me in the past still lamenting a dead hard drive uh so this is uh lawrence walters one of my best friends from high school who was um in town for a few days with his family and uh he was gracious enough to spend part of his family's disney world vacation shooting these silly little skits with me um the rest of his family was off actually doing park stuff and it was just the two of us in the contemporary resort uh i put the camera down on a stool that i think was over by a vacation club kiosk maybe uh, a stool on the other side of this lobby i just put the camera down for the establishing shot and every other shot it's whichever one of us is not on camera is the one behind camera and we're just pretending to look to the side at each other just sucks man i mean i had the next two episodes completely edited they were ready At to go two. and i kept saying to myself you know dave you should really back these episodes up so they're not just on the one hard drive and then i kept putting it off until it was too late uh, yeah when you called me you said a family member had died not a hard drive and the footage was already over a year old anyway i mean do I really want to go and re-edit it again? Is it even relevant at this point? Um, I took a train here from Baltimore. It was kind of expensive. Are you at least going to pay me back for the Coke I bought you? But do I really want to go through the trouble of starting over from scratch? I mean, going on all those rides again, sitting through all those shows, that stupid Little Mermaid show. I mean, is it really worth it? Does anybody really want to watch me go to Disney World? Yeah, this is... This is uh a comedic trope that I always had that I always enjoy. So I was, it, it was um, fun to write a uh, dialogue like this one. It was also, yeah, yes. Thank you for uh, making sure that uh, I won't run into these problems again, as you helped me to my new computer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know if there's a specific name for this type of comedy, uh, the, the type of comedy conversation where one character is clearly not listening to the other, but partly it was just fun to write a dialogue. You know, once I had already moved away from the, um, from the off and vlog that I originally thought Dave does Disney was going to be once I, by this point I knew, okay, this thing is a production. So now I can actually treat it like one. So I can write sketches and stuff. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, probably, I don't know, I've lost track of time, but earlier in the stream, this came up. Um, it seems fine. Like it's cheaper than the past door before closing. They're still doing monthly payments, which is baffling to me. I thought they would get rid of monthly payments because, because monthly payments are like when they introduced monthly payments, the number of passes sold went through the roof. And I thought if they were trying to manage crowds, they'd get rid of monthly payments. But yeah, everything is now fast pass and I'm like, and now that I live in Anaheim, it would be nice to just be able to go in on a whim whenever I want, but I can handle reservations. Um, here's the thing, puppet, the puppeteering is the only thing I like about the, about the Little Mermaid show. I am nice to the puppeteers, I'm just not, I'm just not nice to the show design. <laughs> um, but yes, I know uh, Disney has slash union puppeteers since this era, this was a different time in Disney parks. World. I mean, what is so entertaining about me going to Disney World? This also is the general existential dread I had going into the series of like, why am I doing this? Does anybody care? What, what is the point of me doing this? Um, and then people liked the videos and, uh, but you know, insecurity still reigns supreme when you're a self-proclaimed artist. You've been sitting here moping for six months. I really wanted to ride Primeval World. And I just chose that because it was the first ride I could think of that was a ride I had established not being happy with the existence of. And I thought it would be funny if that was the thing that made him want to come to Florida. You know what, you're right. I'm done moping, I'm done feeling sorry for myself. Today, I finally take on Hollywood Studios. 
There's also, uh, thanks, Mariah. I, I, I think we, uh, if that, uh, I, I think we've talked and realized that you were one, like you are part of my earliest audience. So thank you for sticking with me for the past decade. Yes, uh, the grand Disney tradition of not cooperating with unions. Um, but um, yeah, that bit where I'm like, today I finally take on Hollywood Studios and then I take a sip of the drink. And then uh, right away I was like, I said something like, actually it's too far away, I'm going back to Tomorrowland. Uh, and we got that. But then later when we were in the transportation depot, I thought, actually let, let's, uh, let's have me change my mind here while I'm waiting for the bus. Um, and, and, uh, I probably should have added some, like, like, like girl from, like some hold music here to establish that I'm waiting a long time for this bus, but I don't know. Screw it. I'm going back to tomorrow, Lance. It's no secret. I I'm glad you could be here too. Arts, but just because you love something overall doesn't mean that every little bit of it can grab your interest. As a result, there are some things I've never checked out, even in parks I've visited several times. Also throw in the fact that I wasn't really planning the first batch of Dave Does Disney videos to be in-depth analyses, and I was just going along with whatever rides my friends wanted to do. And that's why there are a number of things in those parks I just kind of glossed over in my videos. But now that I'm back in Florida for a little while longer, I can revisit some of the stuff I skipped. For instance, as of the time I made my Magic Kingdom video, the only Tomorrowland rides I had done were... And yes, here I'm using the Futurama, the extended version of the Futurama theme for Tomorrowland, as opposed to in the first video, where, again, I was trying to use Disney music for the most part, so I used the Buzz Lightyear Star Command theme. Space Mountain and Buzz Lightyear. But now I've checked out more of the Tomorrowland attractions. Unfortunately, the cast members didn't let me film any except for the People Mover. Oh, look, it's Moving People, exciting internet video. Here, I'm not sure if it came across. I'm not trying to be dismissive of the fact that the People Mover is still operating in Florida because I like that it is, and I would like if we still had the People Mover in California. I was just being dismissive of the fact that the People Mover does not make for the most interesting visual in video form. The, the enjoyment of the People Mover involves actually being on the People Mover. And yes, now Futurama is Disney music. And I still do not understand, like, for whatever reason, they've decided The Simpsons is enough of a family brand to be on Disney+. Plus. If The Simpsons is safe for Disney+, Plus, so is Futurama. It doesn't need to be relegated to Hulu. Do, do like, put Futurama on Disney+, Plus and also do a new Futurama season on Disney+. Plus. That's all I'm saying, Disney. So I'll just have to describe what I saw. Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor was a lot like Turtle Talk with Crush, except for Monstropolis stand-up comedians. Stitch's Great Escape had a fantastic Stitch animatronic, but left you smelling like chili dogs. And then there's Carousel of Progress, which I really wish I was allowed to film inside, because there's a lot to say about it. Did I, I probably could have managed to sneak footage from the inside of Carousel of Progress if I retried. But again, I was still like nervous about getting in trouble when I filmed back in these days. Um, and, and uh, I, so, so I, when I, when they said no videotaping allowed, and then I sat through it, I was like, well, it'll be more fun to do the sketch. But if I ever go back to Florida and actually do, uh, Carousel of Progress is still there and it's open and I have the confidence of, to, to film it myself. At least the day I went there was. I don't know if it was official rule, but uh, the safety instructions cast member said no, no filming. <laughs> um, but if I ever go back to Florida and film it again myself, then uh, expect Dave Riff's Carousel of Progress to happen someday, question mark. And again, I know I could just use somebody else's footage, but I prefer not to do that. I prefer to use my own footage whenever possible. Disney built this for General Electric's display at the 1964 World's Fair, and then it was at Disneyland's Tomorrowland until the mid-70s when it was physically moved to Walt Disney World. This makes it not only the oldest attraction at Disney World, but also the only one Walt Disney actually touched. Quick, yeah, that's probably changed the rules at a certain point. 
this was also back in this era, Universal was much harsher on videotaping on attraction than Disney was. So it actually surprised me that like all of the Tomorrowland attractions, when I went, they said no, no videotaping. Uh, again, that for people move around both the year. Um, I think they've relaxed the rules since then when they realized there's no point in fighting it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, at the time, generally Universal was harder on uh, videography in attractions. But uh, at this point, Disney was hard on it sometimes. I, I, I don't know. It probably also depended entirely on who was working that day and how much they actually cared. Like Spaceship Earth, there have been several revisions and versions of this over the years, but they've all showed several scenes of a family throughout various points in history, led by a patriarch currently voiced by the Christmas Story guy. Since I don't have any footage, I'll just have to reenact them. Hey, yes sir, we sure do live in a golden age here in the This was also just so much fun to do with the, the Carousel of Progress sketch here. Um, this is a balcony at the uh, Boardwalk Hotel uh, of the Epcot Resorts. I originally shot a version of this uh, at home, just in case uh, that was what I had to do. But I wanted to keep as much of the uh, as much of the filming on location as possible. So um, back in this day, I'd park at the hotels because I don't know about now, but back then you could park at the hotels for free. So I would just park at the hotels and just wait on transportation to get to park. So one of the times I was parking at the boardwalk to go to Epcot uh, to go through the International Gateway, I found this nice little balcony off of a uh off of a side lobby at the boardwalk hotel and i was like perfect this is where i shall do my carousel of progress uh my carousel my carousel of progress video so yeah i, I had a feeling free hotel parking i was surprised it lasted as long as it did when i lived in florida but uh Yes, yes, indeed. I, 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 uh, I had so much fun doing this bit. 1927, 1940 something, or the 80s idea of the near future. I just love talking about the groundbreaking technological advancements that went into these old timey common household items that I use every day. And I hear tell I'm about to name drop some famous historical figure who's planning something big for next year. But I think it will never amount to a thing. My family sure interrupts me a lot. Women, am I right? Also, I think this show contains a scene where my son's looking at my porn. That's kind of weird. Yes, technology has reached its peak here in the distant past, and it's absolutely impossible that things will ever get any better than they are right now. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow shining on the end of every day. I also uh, realized while doing this, the way to imitate a Disney animatronic, because everybody, when they try to act like an animatronic, their instinct is to like, be all robotic. But if you're trying to be a Disney animatronic, you actually need to over, uh, like, do over fluidity to your motions. And it's like, move big rounded gestures, but then they sort of pause and then pull back and do the same gestures. And that is how you do the... Uh, the, the, the physicality of uh, of a Disney animatronic. And yes, also I am poorly lip syncing to my own dialogue to really sell the animatronic. Patrick Warburton as in Carousel of Progress. <laughs> Yes, overacting hands is a big part of it. See, if I was just doing a riff, like if I wasn't doing the original sketch, if I had just been doing a riff, the first, like probably every time they do that trope in the attraction, I would cut to a famous example of that trope, like like the Titanic, the something Picasso. He won't amount to a thing, he won't. Um. Yes, uh, Chuck E. Cheese level animatronics, the way to do those is to be stiff and robotic, but the way to do Disney animatronics is to over-exaggerate the fluidity. Karen Killam is a 
huge parks guy. Uh, he was on a Carly Wiesel's podcast, very amusing, a few weeks ago, talking about uh, all of his Disney park excitement, uh, including being at the uh, opening of Galaxy's Edge and uh, how exciting that was for him and how uh, Kobe Smolders has apparently had to tell him, you can't keep going to Savi's workshop. We do not need any more lightsabers in this house. So, uh, so yeah, Taryn Killam knows his stuff when it comes to uh, theme parks and animatronics. The gimmick that makes Carousel Progress different is that the scenes don't change on stage. The audience room rotates around the stage. It's just enough of a ride to definitely not be considered a real ride. Despite all of its cheesiness, it has a genuine charm and optimism, and the theme by the Sherman Brothers is just as catchy as Small World, but not nearly as annoying. I also felt bad that I never stuck around Epcot long enough to watch Illuminations after hearing such great things about it. So I rectified that, and yes, Illuminations is much better than Wishes. Fireworks, actual fire, lasers, a jumbotron globe, and so much seating around the lagoon that you can get a slightly different show each time around. Yes, it's a quite impressive tribute to nature, unity, and corporate sponsorship. Presented by Sylvania, a Siemens company. At least they got to that punchline faster than Paul and Storm ever do. Disgusted are from the ladies. And yes, I was making jokes about Siemens being a... Uh, uh, <laughs> A, an inappropriate sounding brand name before uh, Escape from Tomorrow. Um, also, I uh, one of my uh, one of my house at the time had a friend who worked at Siemens, uh, who I hung out with a couple of times. I don't remember what his job was. Um, this Paul and Storm footage is from PAX East 2011, I think. And it's from the Jumbotron, but it's from me filming the Jumbotron. So it's kind of my, it's my own footage, but like my camera picking up what a different camera picked. And of course, this is a, um, this is a reference to their, uh, to their terrible Seaman fun song. More importantly, you've stopped giggling at the word Seaman. That's the mark of a real seaman. Oh, I never said anything about Ellen's energy adventure either, did I? Um, it's long and educational and celebrity centric and a bit dated. It's got some funny jokes. It's got Ellen DeGeneres, so I can use this clip. Whoa, 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 what is this? The Ellen DeGeneres show? It's that, the, that might be the first news radio clip I've used. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, this was uh, like, I actually had most of this episode done before I even rode Universe of Energy. So I, I like this was a very last minute edition. Um, and I basically wrote it exactly once and filmed it. And I was like, well, the ride rips itself. I don't have much to say other than making references, I guess. So I just do cutaway reference like basically the whole game of the scene becomes uh i guess i can do this i guess i can do this and um then later when tony was doing the 30 years of epcot video uh he he did the bit about ripping the attraction and then the attraction makes the joke that he was uh, that 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 he already made and he asked me if it was okay if he did that or if I thought it was too similar to my bit and I was like no go, go ahead it's a, a similar but a different enough angle that I think they're both good and also dude way more people are going to see your video than see mine guys so I can use this clip the plot revolves around Jeopardy so I can use this clip rest in peace Alex has run out the answer was Asia or this clip I lost on Jeopardy or this clip. What is a Regis Philbin? It's got dinosaurs, and wow, Bill Nye is involved in every dinosaur attraction at this resort. It's got robot zombie Ellen DeGeneres, which is just an awesome combination of words. Oh, it's got Jamie Lee Curtis, and she calls Ellen stupid, so I can use this clip. Oh, right! To call you stupid would be an insult to stupid people! It's got an animated representation of the big... Yeah, I kind of miss uh, Energy Adventure just because it was, like interesting and unique but i'm looking forward to cosmic rewind but i guess they dodged a bullet by uh pulling it before uh before all the controversies 
bang, so I'm sure someone will kill me if I don't do this. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state that nearly 14 million years ago expansion started. Wait. It's got Michael Richards as a caveman. Yeah. I can't even choose what I should use for that. Oh, and they talk about oil, so I can use... Oh, oh, what is black gold, Texas tea, swimming pools, movie stars? What is the Beverly Hillbillies? Well, if you're going to make the references before I do, I guess I don't even need to be here. But the part that really... <laughs> Universe of Thrombies. Um, if you haven't seen on a, uh, on Chris's channel, on Remain Seated with Chris Nevergall, uh, they were actually holding the uh, remains of the Ellen animatronic uh, for uh, for the people who bought it before it ended up on Ellen. So he did an up close and personal vlog with that uh, with that hideous animatronic skin. Um, yeah, I I kind of miss the universe of energy, but like again, I only wrote it once and I mostly just miss it in that it would be nice to try it again way and it was like what a unique system way N not in like uh i can't believe they wore it out way really got the short shift of my first batch of videos was animal kingdom since i had only been twice so let's take a look at camp mini mickey which i assumed was just a kids area but in actuality it's even less than that it's themed as a campground where everyone's favorite disney characters hike go fishing and get eaten by bears what the hell and what wondrous campground things are there to do at this camp? Uh, character meet and greets, and that's pretty much it. Why? And uh, yeah, th that is completely different now. <laughs> this area is so cheap? Well, it was originally supposed to be Beastly Kingdom, a fantasy realm that sounds absolutely <clears throat> kick ass, complete with a dragon roller coaster. But the park went over budget, so all that's left of Beastly Kingdom are a few leftover icons and whatever ideas the Imagineers brought to Islands of Adventure's Lost Continent when they left for Universal. That said, there is one reason to cross this bridge, and that's the Festival of the Lion King. Yeah, I was remiss not to try and get to this before releasing the original Animal Kingdom video, considering when Animal Kingdom first opened, it was practically marketed as the Lion King Park. Located in a theater in the round that's bigger than a black box, this is just one of a handful of live shows based on Disney's animated flicks of the 90s, and I'll talk about some others when we get to Hollywood Studios. But the main thing that sets this one apart is that it's not just a straightforward adaptation of the story, it's a festival held by the characters and their inexplicable human narrator friends, celebrating the kingdom's heritage. Each seating section is assigned a different animal, so it sucks. I mean, I would have preferred Beastly Kingdom to just because, you know, I, I, I like original things happening and i still haven't been to pandora so i don't know uh but i've heard good things i'm looking forward to visiting pandora um i think i think pandora makes a lot of sense for a theme park land because again the reason the movie became the biggest hit of all time but then also was promptly forgotten once it was once it was on dvd was because the reason it did so well was people were seeing it over and over again and again to get the big 3D IMAX experience because they wanted to be, they didn't care about the story they wanted to be in the world of Pandora so Avatar fits better as a theme park than it does as an actual movie so like it, it's like if you want to be transported to the world great here's the way to do it but uh, I, I am But again, I haven't seen it myself yet. Um, I wish Beastly Kingdom could have existed, because. Um, but also, the probably the finished version of Blue uh, of Beastly Kingdom would not have been quite as exciting as the Blue Sky version. I, I but I don't know. Who knows? I think I think you can see here's the thing people talk about how like Animal Kingdom is not about animals it's about conservation and the mission statement it all needs to be related to conservation and it's like okay sure but the general public just thinks of it as the animal park so as far as everybody who doesn't spend time obsessing over this stuff on the internet is concerned uh, Zootopia would fit in perfectly in Animal Kingdom and uh as 
Like, honestly, I think you could do a Zootopia story that still is about conservation, especially because the idea of Zootopia is it is different species of different habitats figuring out how to cohabitate. So I think you easily could do a Zootopia experience with a conservation message um, and, yeah, have it where Rafiki's Planet Watch is reaping the train to be the <clears throat> to be the train Judy rides to Zootopia. And again, you can do a conservationist version of Zootopia without much of a challenge, I think. I think it's very doable. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I was going to get, is that probably the version of Beastly Kingdom that finally existed, it probably would have been slightly uh, more exciting than Lost Continent, like, uh, probably the roller coaster would have been better themed than Lost Continent, but ultimately it probably would have gotten watered down to not that much better than Lost Continent. Sucks to be you, warthogs. The human narrators teach the audience to make the animal noises, which sounds dirty when I say it out loud, but I'm sure it's perfectly innocent, right? Hey, what's your name? Tom. Tom. Well, I think that's why he thought it's my lucky day. Festival of the Lion King. Come for the song, stay for the awkward sexual tension with the narrators. Then the animals start to enter, and it turns out animals are actually low-rent Cirque du Soleil dancers. Who knew? Then we hear this familiar sound. And bam, parade floats with animals and a Nathan Lane mascot with a mechanical face. Okay, I realize the idea is to build it around familiar songs from the movie, but why at Simba's Majestic Festival does he have them sing the song from his awkward, self-centered, hedonistic youth? Oh good, the wise, mature Simba has them sing another song that actually represents a low point in the movie's character arc and an attitude that was proven to be incorrect and had to be overcome in order to resolve the central conflict. But what do you expect from the company that constantly tries to pass Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey off as a hero instead of the disobedient troublemaker he was? Disney parks. Missing the f***ing point. And of course, theme park missing the f***ing point merch is now available on my Public. <laughs> um... I think this is the uh, first, yeah, this is the first full riff. I kind of riff the, um, uh, I kind of riff the dinosaur pre-show a little bit, but it's less riff and more just like stopping to rant. This is the first like riff proper I do uh, in Dave Does Disney and it was fun to do and fun to write. And I was not the first riff I wrote because I, in the original uh, Lost Cut of Hollywood Studios, I had done the riffing of Beauty and the Beast live on stage. And in the original video, I just did the riffing and then just hacked it down to just a little portion. And um, then when I was redoing the videos anyway, I was like, you know what? It's actually easier to expand this to a full riff for me than it is to hack it down to a manageable bite-sized chunk. So uh, that's why Beauty and the Beast Live on stage became its own bonus episode. Um, I am not sure because I cannot think offhand of every time Timon has appeared in the parks. So I don't know uh, how often Nathan Lane has played him or not. Yes, these came from the, uh, the, the Disneyland parade and they were moved over to Florida for this show. Um, and yeah, missing the point is a big, again, I, I sort of talk about this in the Beauty and the Beast, uh, riff about how so many of these stories, like they're just hacking them down to the most, uh, merchandisable versions of the characters that it ignores everything like character growth and, uh, story significance and everything. Um, uh, in the case of Pinocchio specifically, though, uh, we talked about this on Escape from Vault Disney, that uh, that real boy Pinocchio is terrifying. And if one of them has to be appealing, it should be the one you spend more of the movie with. But then it makes for a very unsatisfying ending when his end game is to turn hideous. 
Oh, but then there are some neat acrobats dressed as monkeys, so yay. Did Simba get stoned before watching the show? Hey, there, pretty fella. Nice hat. <laughs> so, where you from? But then the lights dim, and Timon gets scared as the head narrator comes out and sings, Be Prepared. I am in some sorting, but you'll be rewarded. But it must have been you for five years. Injustice, delicious. Wait, the narrator is leading a revolt against Simba? Holy crap, what a twist! The narrator, the guy who welcomed us, who we trusted, was evil all along! I thought the classic battle was between evil and the narrator, but no! Look, you can tell they're evil because of all the fire! Why is Simba so okay with this happening? I mean, it's really cool. No, no matter how little sense it makes, it, it's a really cool performance to be prepared. Why are you people applauding? The narrator just saying about overthrowing the king right in front of him. Was... was that really part of the act? I mean, I understand respecting your culture's history, but Simba really wanted a musical number about killing his dad to be part of the festival. Do Civil War reenactments take some time for a John Wilkes Booth tap dance? Man, lions are weird. Oh, but now it all makes sense because it's time for an avian Kama Sutra. <laughs> What's your favorite position? Back to back. LTB clip, How of course. Even... Well, as long as you're happy with it. I'm happy with how that Mary Poppins clip works. Push me higher, push me higher. Go team! Why is the Jerry Lewis? He's not actually that flaily, it just was the only joke I could think of. Oh good, evil narrator went back to his alternate dimension and we have hippie narrator back. And now, everybody, it's time for you to join in the fun as we kick off our celebration finale. The days are getting restless. What, singing Nazi hyena songs wasn't restless enough? I'm sorry, I can't get past that. Almost every song in the show has been either from Simba's hedonistic douchebag youth or from the villain. You can't just take them out of the context of the story and have them work. Ah, but now it's time for a cover of the song that puts the royal in royalty disputes. I think narrators as evil is more common in games than in other media. <laughs> it's finally happened. Disney is pitting its own audience members against each other in a bloody battle royale for their own amusement. I also had that line about uh, the song puts the royal in royalty dispute, and that was because when I looked up the song on Wikipedia, I found out that there's uh, uh, attribution questions regarding the songwriting, and it has been a uh, source of many legal battles, so I offhandedly referenced that there. <laughs> Everyone sings The Lion Sleeps Tonight, some children get abducted, and that's the finale, right? Wrong! We need a medley of all the songs whose presence made no sense. Hey, careful where you swing that bird. You'll chop somebody's head off. Well, except for the living things who are still single. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Ah, simpler times. <laughs> this juxtaposition makes me realize that this might have been a much better villain song. I'm going to be a mighty king. So enemies beware. <laughs> And up here I chose this with the musical number from the beginning of uh, the season of Community that I just started. Uh, hey, Tony, thank you. And yeah, that season was still actively on the air, which is why I had to use the City TV uh, right, TV right, rip. And then all the performers clear the stage, leaving the king just sitting there. Man, Fried Rock's secret service is lacking. Okay, Snarky nitpicks aside, this is actually a pretty good show. It may not hold up to logical scrutiny, but even then it makes more sense than some of the shows that actually try to follow the plots of the movies they're based on. And, uh, yeah, here I used, uh, I did my sort of wrap-up thoughts over the footage of the Circle of Life performance proper from the show, which I... Couldn't think of any jokes for, so I didn't rip it, so I just saved all that footage to go under the wrap-up. But we'll get to that later. But what it lacks in cohesiveness, it more than makes up for in spectacle. The dancers, the acrobats, the colors, the lights, in person, it's all quite breathtaking. And my initial opinion of Animal Kingdom as a whole would have been a lot higher had I seen this originally. While we're still on the subject of the Lion King, Rafiki's Planet Watch. Hey, why not? If nothing else, we get a train ride out of it. The train takes you behind the scenes of the park's more zoo-like operation. I probably also should have structured this video so that uh, it ended with Lion King, like the last riff was the big finale, because now it just sort of keeps going with other things and <laughs> the stuff I missed, and structurally I don't think that uh, works as well as using the big giant riff as a finale it's would have, a but live and learn. have to walk down another trail for a while. Eventually, you get to a building with Epcot-type educational stuff and the promised petting zoo, and there's an educational film narrated by Rafiki, so... Actually, Rafiki contributes very little to his own Planet Watch other than exposition and pointing. So, about as much as he contributed to the movie, then. Yeah, it's admirable of Disney to provide so much educational stuff for the kids, but what kid is really going to have the patience to take a train out of their way and then walk down a path for it? I don't have the patience for it, and I spent the last year of my life cobbling together Disney footage. Anyway, we conclude the Stuff I Missed Last Time tour with Finding Nemo the Musical. I already expressed a distaste for the opening song as it played at Epcot's The Seas, but I have to admit it's a bit better in context, and when it's not being sung by a sappy children's choir. The songs are written by the composers of Avenue Q, which is kind of appropriate since the whole thing has the vibe of an Avenue Q, Julie Taymor sort of thing, with amazing production design, puppetry, and costumes that are either awesome or terrifying. The story is a condensed version of the story from the movie, where Nemo is sought after by Marlon and Dory, played here by impersonators of the Pop My Culture podcast. There's a reference. May I help you? I'm going to call her a cab. <laughs> I'm going to call you a cab, cab. Just... Pop My Culture was a podcast I listened to back in the day that ended a few years ago, but... Uh... Yeah, the actors in this performance reminded me of Cole Stratton and Vanessa Ragland, so I made that reference for me and me alone, just like most of the references on the show. Um, and yeah, the reason I don't do a full riff of Finding Nemo the Musical is because my camera battery died and I couldn't film the entire thing. So I just uh, used some footage and talked about some parts. Um, and I don't know if I would have done a full riff otherwise, but I would have had opportunity to. So, you know, again, maybe someday. Some of the songs are quite good. Some are just average. <laughs> but the show's still worth a watch. So between this and The Lion King, there's two more reasons to visit Animal Kingdom. So that's a few of the things I missed from the first three parks. Join us next time when we look at all the stuff that's changed since I originally looked at these parks. Oh, it takes a little effort to hold your head up straight, to laugh as if you mean it. And a Marion Call song about 
patience to warm up one more smile as my videos took forever to make I took as if that's a past tense thing